Okay, chapter 15, part two of three. So, what is art? So we talked about primitive art and how it really doesn't go with the notion of anthropology and our cultural relativism. So let's talk about art in human history. Archaeology provides us with a unique perspective on the role of artistic expression throughout human history. While we can look around the world today and see that virtually all cultures partake in creative forms of expression, archaeology has shown us that, that virtually all cultures in the past also created art form of painting, sculptures, engravings, and more. What is particularly impressive is how far back we can trace this notion. Starting around 40,000 years ago, archaeologists found a notable expansion in the use of art. In the terms of the oldest known examples, we have to go back much further in time. So, the Blue Moss Caves in South Africa. The Blue Moss Caves is a small cave in South Africa overlooking the Indian Ocean. The site has long been studied by archaeologists produced notable quantities of human skeletal materials and stone tools, such as spear points, choppers, and scrapers, all dating back to at least 75,000 years ago. Recently, however, new artifacts have come out of the Bloom's Cave. Archaeological archaeologist Christopher Henslingwood and his colleagues have recently discovered blocks of red ochre with symbols carved into them. More remarkable than that is what appears to be painter's toolkit. This kit includes bone tools from mixing paints and stones for grinding mineral pigments. We can't say for certain what was being painted, but variety types of body paint is the likely answer. Dating in archaeology can be problematic, but these artistic tools likely to date back to about 100,000 years ago. This suggests that human beings started to express themselves artistically in a very early date. So Paleolithic, Paleolithic cave paintings in Europe. The most famous example of early human art, however, comes from the Paleolithic cave paintings in Europe. All across Europe, over 100 caves with paintings dating back between 32,000 and 10,000 years ago have been found. You've likely heard of some of the more famous caves, including the cave in France and one in Spain. While there's a great deal of variety in these caves, a majority of the paintings depict herds of animals. In many cases, multiple animals were painted together in a scene. Some caves include hundreds of individual paintings. The quality of many of these paintings is impressive, even to artists today. In most cases, these are not simply stick figure drawings, but instead dynamic portraits of animals and even people. The exact meaning of these paintings and the reasons they were made have been hotly debated by archaeologists and anthropologists for many decades. While on occasion some predatory animals are depicted, it is notable that the majority of the animals painted on cave walls are herd beasts that humans would have actively hunted. Most archaeologists today accept the idea that these paintings were made either as a supplicant ritual for the, a good hunt or that people went down in the caves and painted a portrait of the type of animal they wished to kill or perhaps instead of more collaborative activity they painted animals that they had successfully hunted. Regardless of the precise cultural meaning of European cave art, or even of the Bloom's painter's kit, it is clear that artistic expression has been a part of human lives for many thousands of years. So, what is unique about how anthropologists study art? 
As we have seen, anthropology, uh, entra, the, as we have seen, the anthropological study of, hum, of art focuses on the interplay between art and other cultural institutions. Art is fully embedded in social networks, gender, authenticity, power, and so on. Anthropologists seek to describe how art fits into these different contexts. So, the ethnography of art. When conducting ethnographic studies of art, anthropologists pay close attention not only to the context, but also to the relationship between the producer and the consumer. Anthropologists attempt to analyze the significance of, bar, of art on both of those levels. Okay, so let's start with an example of a West African art. Anthropologist Christopher Steiner carried out ethnographic research with art traders based in the city of Ajuba in Cote d'Ivoire. These traders would buy pieces from producers living in the countryside and then sell them to dealers in the city. The dealers in turn sold these pieces primarily to tourists and to international art market. Because the art pieces are largely intended for West a Western audience, the aesthetic demand of the audience dictates the pieces should look like. Western, Westerners largely wanted to buy authentic African art. In short, they wanted something tribal or primitive. Sterner found in his study that traders would pressure local producers to meet this demand. As a result, local producers often dirtied, stained, or artificially aged their products, all to make the objects appear primitive. In other words, they created the authenticity that the customer demanded. Sterner also noted that authentic authenticity was further performed by traders and dealers when selling to Westerners. Traders would often create stories about the object's origin or invent ritual or cultural significance for a piece. This was done to further enhance the authenticity of the piece to buyers. While in reality, the piece was made specifically to sell to the art, to sell at the market. Whether a buyer wants to admit it or not, actual real cultural artifacts are not sitting in a market stall for sale. In many ways, the buyers are purchasing the experience that they want. So, in transforming Western wood and mud into global art. West African art today is no longer a symbol of local tradition. Many of the art objects made in Western Africa today are made with the intention of being shipped to the United States or other Western countries. Once in the United States, new network of African traders spread the wares throughout the country. These traders live fully in an economic marketplace and are not artistic artists themselves. Their interest in the value of the objects and their ability to sell them to shops and markets across the country. This African art style is widely copied and produced within the United States, most notably for na nationwide chains such as Pottery Barn, which exhibits authentic objects for sale that are in reality mass produced. So, what is the relationship between art and power? Art has frequently been used to negotiate relationships between artists, audiences, and cultural powers. Often it's possible to say something through art that could not be said through any other means. King's gestures in medieval time is a very classic example. The gesture's job was to entertain the king's court. Within, the pro within that process, he was allowed to make jokes and otherwise lampoon the royal power. Sometimes that could be very well have resulted in the death sentence in any other context. Anthropologists have paid particular attention to the negotiation that happens between art and power. End of part two or three.